But what about you? What do you do with your freedom, especially at the back of COVID-19? What are we doing with our freedom? It's amazing, isn't it? That period of time we felt so restricted. We were so restricted. And yet now we have our freedom. What do we do with it? We're free to choose what clothes we wear in the morning. Do we dress up smart or do we dress up casual? We're free to meet with however many people we would like to now. There's no limit or restriction on how many people we can meet or where we can meet them or what we might do when we hang out. Depending on the restaurant or supermarket opening times, you're free to eat almost anything you would like to eat and whenever you want to eat it. And on the weekends, I'm free to do my jobs, my chores, or I'm free to go out and hang out with my friends. We are largely a pretty free people. And Paul, at the end of chapter 5, is telling us that we are not only free to choose what we eat when we want to eat it, we're not only free to choose what we want to wear when we want to wear it, we are also free from the rule of sin and we've been set free into the rule of grace with Jesus as our King. And we've been set free into relationship with our Father in heaven. And that's such an amazing statement, and I know that Lisa did such a great job last week of unpacking Romans 5. But Romans 5 gives us a problem. And it's a problem that Paul addresses at the start of chapter 6. Because at the end of chapter 5, Paul's telling us that we are free from the rule of sin, but that could potentially create a problem for us. Because if that really is true, then we have this question to answer. If we've been set free to live by grace, does it then really matter how I conduct myself? Does it really matter how then I live in light of that? And surely I could just carry on sinning. Surely I could just carry on living the way that I've always lived before meeting and encountering Jesus. Because it doesn't matter. Paul, after all, you've just told us that grace abounds and increases wherever and whenever I sin. So if anything, in a roundabout way, in a roundabout way, I must be helping God when I sin because I'm helping him show more grace to people. Therefore, be more gracious and be more like who he really is. I don't have to bother to deal with my flaws and my failures because God gets to be more gracious the more sinful I am. And this morning, we're going to go through chapter six, which is Paul's answer to this question where he says, absolutely not. No way. No way should we live like that as followers of Jesus. In fact, he builds an argument to say, not just no, but that's unthinkable. As followers of Jesus, that shouldn't even be on our radar as a way of living. And I know for some of us this morning, we know the short answer to that question, don't we? We know that we shouldn't keep on sinning. We know that no is the right answer. But sometimes we just settle for knowing the right answer and not really understanding and going deep on why that's the answer. Because I know on some level, because I know it myself, that we live with tension in our lives as followers of Jesus. The tension between wanting to live for him and be obedient to him and then the desire to give in to our flesh and to our weaknesses and to ourselves. There are times where Jesus is all that we can think about and all that we want to do is worship him and be with him. And there are times where all we can think about is sin and all we want to do is sin. You might also be here this morning and you might be exploring who Jesus is. You wouldn't yet say you follow or believe in him. But you would recognise there's stuff in your life that you are not proud of. There's things, patterns of behaviour that you are stuck in, attitudes in your heart that don't quite stack up for you. This morning we're hopefully going to see that Jesus has made us to be new people with a new life and we are to submit to a new master. And that that will release us to live the lives that Jesus has called us to live as free people, free from sin and alive to God. So first of all, we are new people. Romans 6 verse 3 and 4 say this. This is Paul speaking. Have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined him in his death? For we died and we were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we may also live new lives. Anyone here live with someone who watches terrible, terrible television? Thank you. Okay, a few few friends. Ali watches a horrendous program at the moment. It's about makeup artists. I think it's called Glow Up. Up, Thank you. (laughs) Horrendous. One of the worst bits of television I've ever seen. And although... However, the show is appalling. I will concede that the people on it are very talented. 
They can do some incredible things, can't they? they I don't know why I'm saying can't they. Most of you probably haven't seen it. It's terrible. <laughs> they can do some amazing things. They sit these uh, people, with the models in the chairs, and then they create these elaborate things, on, mainly on people's faces, and they completely transform the person, whether it's making them look like they're you know, an animal or some, the solar system. I don't know. There's some random stuff that goes on people's faces. But they're able to totally transform people in a matter of hours. But despite the dramatic transformation, nothing changes about that person. Nothing really significant changes about that person despite the makeup that they've got on. And Paul here, in beginning his argument for our freedom from sin, is grounding it in the fact that our old life of sin isn't like some, Jesus has given us a makeover. It's not like he's found us and then rescued us and gone, oh, I'll just tidy you up a bit and change the way you look and then, and then off you go without doing anything really significant on the inside. He doesn't brush anything to the carpet, under the carpet, but Jesus said, no, your old life, before you chose to follow me, your old life is dead. Your old life is gone. The person we were before receiving forgiveness from Jesus is a totally different person to the one we are now as his disciple. And Paul uses baptism to show us this clearly. That, and baptism, as we've explained many times before, is just a public declaration. It's a sign of what God has done on the inside of a Christian. There's symbolic significance in the person going down into the water, just as Jesus went down into death, and then being drenched from head to toe in water, just as Jesus' blood cleanses us from all sin, head to toe. And then emerging up out of the water again as a new person in him. And Paul says that we've joined Christ in his death. Jesus really did die. Jesus really did, really was subject to torture and crucifixion by the Romans. His heart stopped beating and he was laid to rest in a tomb having been taken down from the cross. And therefore, those of us who have been united with Jesus know that we have been united with him in that death. That our old lives, the heart has stopped beating on our old life. We are dead and in the grave and that, our, and that it has ceased to exist. And Paul says we don't just keep on sinning because sin belongs to the old me. And the old me is the dead me. Much like wearing a ring doesn't make me married to Ali. But it's a sign to all of you that I am married to Ali. Baptism is the sign of the sure and certain work that Jesus has done on the inside of us and it expresses that our old life is buried with him. And if you this morning would identify as someone who follows and loves Jesus but you haven't yet been baptised in water, I'd love to chat to you at the end. I don't want to expose you, I don't want to make you respond publicly and say, oh no, I'm not baptised, I don't really know what that means. Just come and chat. I'd love to talk to you about where you're at on your journey with Jesus and why baptism is really important and why it's a great step for you to take. So we see firstly that we are new people. We, have new, we, are, we are new creations. We are the, old, the old me is dead and buried. And secondly, we are new people with new life. Isn't it true that we can be alive and yet not experience the full benefits of being so? If any of you have ever had an operation, uh, I had an operation when I was about eight I think I broke my arm uh, quite badly clean break on both bones in my arm coming off my bike uh, and I still remember the moment where I uh, the nurses were sort of saying right you're about to you know I'm going to put the anesthetic on you've got to go for your operation and they're like oh I'm going to count to ten. One, two, three, bang gone and you you are alive you don't my heart didn't stop beating it slowed down I calmed down and I was pretty out of it but I certainly wasn't living in the fullness of life at that moment and again, those of you that have been unconscious before or whatever, you know that there are moments where you are living, where you are alive, but you're not living in the fullness of your life. Romans 6 verse 6 says, We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. Did you catch that? Sin has lost its power. Our old lives that are now dead and buried were characterized by sin by our being ruled over and dominated by our sinful desires and sinful actions. And like I said at the beginning, if you don't yet follow Jesus, you might identify with that. The sense of lacking control in your actions, almost as if there's a war going on inside of you. Even for Christians this morning, despite making that decision to follow Jesus, 
Many or all of us would recognise there are moments in our lives of wanting to live for God and please him, but then feeling like we've got a rope tied around us that's pulling us back into former behaviours and actions. And I just want you to take encouragement from this, that Jesus, when he came and dwelt amongst us, when he put on human flesh, he was in those moments both God and man. There was never a moment where he laid aside his divinity. There was never a moment where he stopped being God, but he experienced life as you and I experience life. He knows what it is to experience the desires of the flesh, to be tempted by the devil, to be hungry, to be sad, to be grieving, and equally to be happy and joyful and not let pride take over in those moments. And in and through all of those things in his life on earth, he never sinned. Where you or I get it wrong, even some of us, you know, I, I, a lot of you, you're really nice people, you're really great people, not like me. You live pretty good lives, but all of us have these moments, don't we, where we lose control a little bit, where we slip, where we do things wrong, where we think things wrong, where we say things wrong. Jesus never had any of those moments, and that was him living as a man. That was him living as a man. And because of his sinlessly perfect life, a life over which sin had no ultimate power, when he was killed, God vindicated him. He was unjustly killed and therefore when the Romans put him to death, God said, no way. My innocent son cannot be kept in the grave. He is the righteous one. The power of death could not hold him and he burst forth in glory and light because of his righteousness. Did you know that because death no longer has any power over Christ, it no longer has any power over those of us who are in Christ? Because we were buried with him, because our old life sits with him in the grave, we are released and raised into new life with him. Sometimes as Christians we stop at the, our old life is buried. I'm a new creation. Yes, forget the old me. But what about the new you? What about the power by which you have to now live your new life? Don't just celebrate the victory of the past. Yes, that's important. But look ahead to the future. Walk in the power of God. You see, after Jesus was raised from the dead, he spent time with his disciples. And then he ascended to be with the Father until the appointed time where he would come again and return. And in the meantime, he leaves for the disciples initially and then for all of us as his followers throughout all time, he leaves us a gift. He doesn't just beat down the power of sin and death and the enemy, he leaves us with a new power. He leaves us with the power of the Holy Spirit. Listen to this from John's Gospel, chapter 14. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The Spirit of Truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Before long the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, so also you will live. On that day you will realise that I am in my Father and you are in me and I am in you. Jesus gives the gift of the Holy Spirit to us as his disciples so that we might have a helper. So that we might have someone in life who it's almost as if Jesus is with us right there. So that we might know God intimately with us for all of our days. So that we might know truth. So that we might know that we are not orphans in those moments where we're tempted to believe that we're unlovable and that no one really cares. We can know that we are dearly loved sons and daughters. Why? Because the Holy Spirit testifies to our spirit that we are indeed children of God. And notice then what Jesus says. Because he lives, we also will live. He is in his Father and we are in him. And he is in us. There's this intimacy to life with Jesus. You know, some people grab for power and it's all about a stage or a platform or a job or a role or a title. For Jesus, power dynamics work in relationship. We receive his power when the Holy Spirit comes upon us. We receive his power when we commune with him deeply and intimately each and every day, when we walk with him and by the power of his Holy Spirit. The power by which we lived our old life was the power of sin. The power by which we live our new life is the power of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit loves to glorify Jesus. And so as we live by his power, 
we live in a way that glorifies him. When the temptation to sin says, I'll oh, pull back here, the power of the Holy Spirit says, no, I want to glorify Jesus. And that spirit at work in us makes us want to glorify Jesus. Free from the power of sin in Jesus. We aren't merely new people, we are people with a new life. And this morning, if you've never had an encounter with God's spirit, we talked about being baptised in water. We also talk about being baptised in the Holy Spirit. The word literally means drenched. We don't just dabble with God. This power isn't like a little drop of something that we kind of receive a little bit of and feel a bit better. God wants to drench you in his Holy Spirit this morning. God wants to just pour out his Holy Spirit in such a way that every area of your life is affected. He's jealous. It's like a consuming fire. It licks up everything that does not honour and glorify him and totally overtakes us. And it empowers us, the Holy Spirit empowers us to live life to the fullest. If you want to know the life that Jesus has for you, ask for more of the Holy Spirit. Ask for a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit in your life that you might know freedom and life to the full. We're a new people with new power. And finally, Paul shows us that we also have a new master. Got a little picture up here. Does anyone know who this is? Ten points if you do. This is pretty obscure. Anyone? No? Okay, I'll tell you. This is Hiro Onoda. He was a Japanese soldier in the Second World War and he spent 29 years in the jungle after the end of the war refusing to surrender because he didn't believe that the war was over. He was holed up on a Japanese island somewhere with orders not to surrender and so he did not surrender. <laughs> It took his former commanding officer to be flown over to meet him on the island in 1974 for him to finally stand down. And that's the picture of him surrendering his sword. Can you imagine living life for almost 30 years in isolation, thinking that things are a certain way, thinking that the war is still going on and that you must not surrender when in fact the whole world has moved on? Paul, in this chapter of Romans, goes on to explain to us how much things have changed for those of us who are in Christ. Verse 14, sin is no longer your master. The old way, the old times have gone. For you no longer live under the requirements of the law. You're no longer being judged on your performance. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. Paul is showing us that not only did sin have power over us in our old lives, but that it was our master. It was like this guy who was stuck, hold up, do not surrender, do not give in, do not change. We were stuck in that rule while other people are getting free. Jesus is already moving in other people's lives and we're stuck, we're stuck in sin. Sin had a controlling and unbreakable hold over us and the longer we spent under it, the more it mastered us. That is that it shaped and moulded us into sin's image rather than into the image of God. We grew more and more sinful as its control gripped us tighter and tighter. And Paul actually goes one step further with this imagery and he likens us to those who were enslaved to sin. That sin wasn't just our master but that we belonged to sin. And we were trapped as instruments to serve sin. Our bodies, our lives were used as ways of furthering the cause of sin and evil in the world where we were not in Christ. Now I wonder if you've ever thought of yourself as an instrument. Take Sean's guitar for example. I'm not going to unplug it. I'll get in trouble. But this, I think you'll agree, is a beautiful instrument, right? This was designed to create beautiful sound and help us in this context encounter God and if it's being played beautifully like it was this morning, it's fulfilling its purpose. It's being used as an instrument for good. Put it in my hands. And I get me to, I'm not going to even try because I'm that bad. It suddenly becomes an instrument for evil. If I tried to leave you, lead you in worship right now, you would all walk out and leave. I promise you. And Paul says we are like an instrument. We are designed, created to be used by God for God's plans and God's purposes. And we can present ourselves to God through the work of Jesus on the cross. And we can say, God, use me as I was intended to be used. Or 
when we belonged to sin, when we were mastered by sin, we were essentially presenting ourselves like a guitar to someone who knows no, has no idea what they're doing with a guitar. In the hands of skilled musicians, these things can be used to create beautiful noise. In my hands and in the unskilled hands, it's an instrument for evil. And Paul encourages us to see ourselves the same way. Romans 6 verse 12, do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God. For you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Sin is no longer your master, for you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. As a person, as a, sorry, as a new person with new life, we are to submit to our new master. We are to present ourselves to him and say, God, as this new person that you have made me to be, with the power that you've given me by the Holy Spirit, I present myself to you. I offer myself to you as an instrument for your plans and purposes. We're starting to get, aren't we, why Paul answers this question, can we just keep on sinning with an absolute resounding no. It makes no sense. It makes absolutely no sense, given all that we've talked about, to say, as a new person with new life, I'm just going to keep doing the things that I used to do for the person that I used to do it for. It would be like me when I changed jobs a few years ago, turning up to the office at Hedge End on my first day with my NHS computer and my spreadsheets and all my to-do lists from my previous job and saying, guys, I'm, I'm getting loads done here. I'm cracking right on. I'm being so productive. It would be great if I was still in the NHS, but it would do nothing to further my cause or the church's cause in my new role. And I felt like God this morning just gave me uh, sort of a picture or, uh, yeah, call it a picture. I don't think it is a picture, but God gave me something uh, that I think is for one of you here today. And that is that you're living your life almost like you're on the run from sin. And in the context of this whole sort of slaves and masters and being purchased by God for God, that there's something in you that you believe that God hasn't paid off your former master of sin. God's just stolen you, like something out of Taken. He's come and rescued you and got you and just run away with you. And therefore you live your Christian life looking over your shoulder as if your old master's pursuing you. You feel like you're being hunted down by sin. You feel like you're hiding with God and just saying, God, just keep me safe from the stuff that I used to do. Did you know God has not just simply, he has rescued you, of course he has. But he rescued you by paying for you. He purchased your life with his own blood. And that means there's no looking over our shoulder to our old lives. That means we can walk free and look ahead at the new life that he has for us, that he set us free into. So this morning, if you're hanging on to stuff, I just encourage you as we respond in a moment, just spend a moment asking God to reveal that truth to you afresh, that you are not just stolen from the enemy God hasn't just raided the enemy's camp and stolen you out under the cover of darkness. He's walked right in. He's walked right in. He's disarmed the enemy. They've laid down arms. They've taken off the handcuffs and he's leading you out. And there's no need to look behind. There's no need to look to your old life. There's no need to look to the things that you used to do, the strongholds that once held you. Because you've got new life ahead in Jesus. And what does life under our new master look like? Some would say, you know, You're talking about freedom, Tom. That doesn't sound very freeing. It just sounds like I've gone from one master to another. Well, the important distinction is that our new master is nothing like our old master. That last line, that last verse. You no longer live under the requirements of the law and instead you live under the freedom of God's grace. The freedom of God's grace. Jesus as the new master sets us free. And I don't know what you imagine or believe freedom to be. Like we discussed at the beginning, it might be freedom to choose what you wear, what you eat, what you do, who you see. Some even take the notion of freedom a step further and say freedom is the, is the absolute lack or uh, the absence of rules or barriers. Free to be who I really am, free to do whatever I want. And we know that that takes us into some dangerous territory, but I le- believe that true freedom is this. 
And this is a quote from Chris, who's preaching at Hedge End. Uh, and I heard this when he practiced it, and I thought it was so good, I'm just going to steal it shamelessly. Freedom is the ability to say yes to Jesus, unaffected by sin. Freedom is the ability to say yes to Jesus, unaffected by sin. Do you see the, the dynamic change there? We spend so much of our Christian lives feeling like we are, freedom is just going to be suddenly this magical moment where everything loses its power and nothing really tempts me. Freedom is the ability to say yes to Jesus, unaffected by sin. Where I say, actually, these things, even though they tempt me, even though there's still things that would try and entrap me or lure me, I am free because of the new person, the new life that I have in Jesus to choose him. And that means I might live my life differently to the people around me. I'm free to not sleep with my fiancé before we get married. I'm free not to drink a ton load of beers with my mates down the pub. I'm free to honour my commitment to God by not working on a Sunday. Whatever it is, whatever you choose to put in and fill in the blank there, you're free to do it and you're free to choose Jesus. That's what true freedom is. Choosing Jesus. Are you living free this morning? Free from the power of sin that ruled your old life that's now been buried in the grave with him. Free to live according to the desires of the spirit who dwells within us rather than the desires of the flesh. Free to serve our true master instead of being a slave to sin. This morning, because of what Jesus has done, those who trust in him are new people with a new life under a new master. And all of us will join with the Apostle Paul in answering that question, why don't I just keep on sinning? Why don't I just keep living my life like it was my old life? With a resounding and absolute no way. No way. We're going to respond together now if the worship team could jump up. And I think just a threefold response this morning. If when I talked earlier on about baptism, you are yet to be baptised in water, can I just encourage you? I'd love to chat with you. I'm not going to tell you off for not being baptised already. I just want to talk to you about it and where you're at and help you understand and make that next step in your journey with Jesus. Secondly, in a moment when the guys play, we're just going to ask the Holy Spirit to come. So much of our lives as Christians is spent doing things in our own strength, trying to make things happen, trying to drudge on through, and actually all we need to do is ask the Holy Spirit to come and empower us, to come and dwell within us and come and refresh us and pour himself out afresh on us. And then thirdly, if you're recognising this morning that you're not surrendered to the new master, that you are still enslaved to the master of sin, I want to just provide a moment for you now just to respond. So why don't we all stand... I'm just going to pray. And if you want to surrender to Jesus for the first time or you've been uh, in a phase of life recently where you feel like you've wandered from God, just use this now as an opportunity to re-surrender to him as well. Jesus, thank you. Thank you that in you we have new life. Thank you that our sin, our old life of sin is dead and buried in the grave. And Lord, we can know new power, new life in you. And Lord, I pray for those this morning who are coming and just saying, yeah, I'm still submitted to that that master of sin. I'm an instrument. I recognize that I'm an instrument for sin and to be used by sin. God, right now, would you come and fall afresh upon us? Jesus, would you be revealed to people right across this room this morning as the mighty king, as the gracious one, as the saviour of the world who comes with arms wide open and says it's not about your sin anymore it's about what I've done to conquer sin Jesus we just pray help us to repent help us to turn back and away from our our sinful desires and actions those things that that don't honour you and glorify you and we pray set us free this morning set us free to live for you we come in all humility before a holy God and we say Jesus would you come and have my life I offer it up to you trusting and believing in your work on the cross your death and resurrection that I might know newness of life and life to the full pray that in Jesus name if you want to just come and chat about that again you're more than welcome as people around the room, John and Linda on the welcome team and others who I'm sure will be really happy to pray with you and for you.
but just want to lead us into worship by asking the Holy Spirit to come. Jesus, we're here for you and we love you and we recognise that that's the kind of environment that your Holy Spirit loves to come and fall upon. They're the kind of people that your Holy Spirit loves to come and dwell within and manifest this presence in. So Holy Spirit, we just pray, come refresh our hearts this morning. As we talked about baptism, come and drench us in your Holy Spirit this morning, right from the very top of our head to the ends of our toes. We want to know more of you, Holy Spirit. We want to know the power by which you lived, Jesus, in our lives today. The power to say no to sin and yes to Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit, meet with us here, we pray.